Walden is straight. <laughs> all cis, all heterosexual. Walden is white. Very, very white. I don't know of any queer teachers or staff during the 10 years I was there, and I only know of one person in my class who came out years later in high school. As a child, it didn't really seem like there were any benefits to being a person of color, and more specifically, a woman of color. My elementary school, Walden, was tiny. Preschool through eighth grade, about 100 people on a good year. You walk through that door at three years old and you're trapped as that person until you graduate and go to high school. Walden is fueled on a culture of not talking about things. If no one saw and no one heard, it didn't exist in the sphere of rigid acceptability. Walden doesn't talk about the queer community and LGBTQ issues, doesn't talk about race, doesn't begin to teach kids about marginalization and oppression, the whole school is silent and pretends to be blind, leaving anyone who doesn't fit in behind. Well, it's confusing because at that point, in those younger years, like in elementary school, I didn't really know what it meant to be a woman of color. As a woman of color raised by a white mother and the parents of color not in the picture, you don't have any cultural ties really anymore without that per without that parent of color in your life. So growing up in a space like that, you know, I don't really know my own roots, but I also can't escape them. Even though I act the same, I talk the same, I have very much the same experiences as everybody there. The, the color of my skin, the color of my hair, the shape of my nose, those key uh, factors, those key characteristics of me definitely define me as a Filipino woman. I guess I started to know I was gay in middle school, but I didn't have any words to put to it. I had no people in my life to look up to, and liking girls seemed forbidden, abnormal. I felt totally alienated during conversations about crushes and sleepovers, and dating boys felt unnatural, even more isolating, if anything. It was only after a particularly abusive relationship with a boy that I started a conversation with myself, started reading books and hunting for meanings on the things that I was feeling. I grew up never really understanding that I was different than other people. I went to a private school and people were very, very accepting. It was a pretty diverse environment and we didn't talk about race. It wasn't a thing. And as soon as transitioning to a public school in the whitest area of Vermont ever, that's when people really started talking about race. And that's when I really figured out, whoa, I'm not like everybody else. When I first started considering the word lesbian, there was an incident one day at recess. I was playing with one of my friends, and the school bully, who had taken a particular liking to targeting me, saw us and called us fucking lesbians, with so much hate and disgust in his voice. It was sixth grade, and the entire class came up with the Daisy the Big Nose sixth grader song in which everyone, to the tune of Rudolph, sang about my big nose and other Filipino traits, talking about how like all the other sixth graders didn't want to, you know, engage in any games. That was something, it was like seen as a joke, everyone thought it was really funny, but like my nose was something that I was so self-conscious about because it was one of the key identifiers. We were young kids, holding hands and running around like kids do, and he called us fucking lesbians. He was never punished for this, even though we reported him even though we sat in the principal's office making our arguments, even though we talked to the guidance counselor about how inappropriate it was, the guidance counselor just told us, boys will be boys. It was just a joke. Get over it. Don't be so sensitive. I definitely have experienced internalized oppression, so I've really felt, you know, I hate my ethnic roots. I wish that I had blue eyes. I wish that I had white skin. When I wrote stories about who I would be in an alternate universe, I was always the super pale, like, snow white kind of character. This was the first and only lesson I got on what Walden thought of queer people, and it terrified me. Like, I just wasn't at a level within myself. I wasn't able to recognize the power and beauty of color. When I finally decided to come out to my parents, I was scared of what they'd say. I think deep down I was scared they'd tell me I wasn't really a lesbian, that this little label, this 
tiny box that had become a source of stability for me wasn't actually where I belonged. That I was broken. A freak. The only one of my kind. I wish I'd had someone to talk to. I needed to talk about it, but there was no one else in my world who would understand. Having white friends was kind of hard sometimes because I never, again, like, we never talked about race. And it was something that I needed to talk about. It was something that affected me on a daily basis. It's something that I should have been talking about a long time ago, but I never existed in a community that was supportive of talking about it. I didn't, not that people were always unsupportive, they just weren't supportive. It was very, you know, people didn't reach out to me and try to engage me in those conversations, and I never saw the opportunity to talk about it because it's not like we had that in common, you know? I wasn't going to talk to my white friends about being Filipino because they weren't going to understand. I know now the extent of the LGBTQ community, and I also understand that this culture of silence often leaves young, closeted queers behind, thinking they're abnormal and alone. I remember this feeling, and it's more isolating than anything I've ever experienced since. For me, growing up with all white friends really just enforced that idea of never talking about it. It just was something that always got pushed to the back burner. It was something that was festering inside of me. It was like, you know, I could never really talk about it because I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know who to talk about it with. When I came out to Daisy, I was terrified she wouldn't want to be my friend anymore. That sleepovers and late night chats would be over. That she would think I was abnormal. I was wrong, and it felt amazing to have somebody in the world who loved me for me with no hiding or facades. I made her promise not to tell anyone else. I didn't want people at school to know. When people made gay jokes and ignorant comments, I could hide. I thought at the time that that's what was best for me, to hide and not have their words be targeted. I think the biggest thing about being the only woman of color in such a white town is being told what I am and being told of the expectations of who I should be. Even though I was born and raised here, people still assume that I'm foreign, that I am not from here, that I don't know their ways. People only see that outside and then make assumptions on who I am as a person. I saw Daisy deal with people's shit every day. Insults and stereotypes and prejudice. People made stupid jokes and songs and insults that she had to either confront or walk away. Daisy has always put herself forward as so strong and powerful, so unabashedly, unapologetically herself. She always tells the world to fuck off and let her be herself. People have always tried to tell her who she is and what she believes, and probably always will assume and speak for her. Growing up, she may not have known how to put her feelings into words, never been taught how to live in a world rigged against her just because of the way she looks. But no matter how bad things got, Daisy was always true to herself, and the strongest person I have ever met. Listening to different musicians of color, especially rapping and, and singing about the things that, that I was experiencing. Um, because in school it was never taught, you know, we didn't learn about race in school. If we did, we only learned about slavery in America, and that was very whitewashed anyway. And so we never talked about anything that really seemed to correlate with, with how I was feeling. We didn't talk about microaggressions. I would always be feeling cognitive dissonance, but at the time I didn't know what that was. So this was something that I really just had to come up with a lot on my own and I think that when I joined a stand-up group when when people actually organized a stand-up group for social justice at my high school is when I could really really start like learning about this stuff and engaging in it. I never learned how to say fuck it and be myself but when I went to high school I listened to Daisy. I came out to everyone I met during the first interaction so people knew what they were getting into and I knew I wouldn't be hiding. It was a huge confidence boost, being transparent for the first time and having people see me for me. Because I had those people who loved the real me, people who directed their hatred couldn't hurt as much. Realizing that these were actual concepts and that the feelings that I had were justified and that other people felt them and that, you know, when I felt cognitive dissonance, that's a thing, like that's an actual term, that's a concept that other people relate to when I found out that like, 
It wasn't weird for me to be feeling out of place. It's still hard sometimes. I'm still coming to terms with my queerness. There are people in my family who definitely know I'm gay, but I will never come out to. It will just remain some unspoken thing between us. I would tell myself that you're not alone and that things seem like they're spiraling out of control, but everything can change. Everything can get better. And the older you get, the more control you have over your life. You're not alone. I know that sounds so cliche, but um, it's really hard when you feel like you're the only one or when you really are the only one. <laughs> like in my case, you know, there were people, um, I didn't know them, I didn't know where to find them. Wasn't huge on the internet yet. <laughs> the world is definitely stacked against you in a lot of ways. And there may be times when you feel like you're the only one, but no matter what, it's better to accept yourself and allow others to see who you are rather than to hide. The biggest piece of advice would be to not try so hard to fit in and to rather embrace what you have and to reach out and try to make sense of the way you're feeling rather than pushing it aside and just trying to blend in with everyone else and just forget about who you are because when you decide to lose your identity when you decide to cram who you are into a tiny box and lock it away that's so detrimental that's what leads to internalized depression if you just go if you live your entire life hating yourself what is that gonna do you know that teaches everyone else that they're allowed to hate you too it reinforces the idea that you are not good enough it reinforces their opinions of you that you're not good enough and when you come to accept it they will come to accept it too the first step is always 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 going to be you accepting your differences and you accepting yourself the way you are before they're going to accept it they're never ever going to accept you unless you accept yourself because they don't have to that's something else that i really learned um looking back at middle school too it's you know that's the advice i'd give myself you know what like by hating yourself you're teaching them that it's okay to hate you too and by hating yourself, you're allowing them to win. You're allowing them the satisfaction of being right. And when you choose to love yourself instead and to accept yourself, you know, hopefully at one point or another, they're going to join that train and, um, you know, learn from you. The hate will only hurt more if you try to build up walls. And the people who love you for you will make sure you never feel alone.